But as I say, it's very much a conversation. So if you're on Zoom, then please use the Q&A tab at any stage to ask a question, um, which we can either, which we'll take in the Q&A session at the end. And if you're on Facebook, then please use the comments section. But if you are on Facebook, please recognise we're going to come up in a second with a couple of poll questions. You won't be able to uh, take part in that poll unless you're registered through Zoom. So to, do consider doing that. Now this is the second, as I said, of our webinar series and if you would like uh, to suggest topics um, that we're running through the rest of the year, then please do send them through to education at worldhorsewelfare.org. So before um, we start, I'm just going to share my screen because we've got a couple of poll questions uh, to ask you and I want to put that first poll question to you once I can, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a techno um, um, amateur here we go so the first question just to get us going do you think it is always right to quarantine a new horse or do you think it is important sorry to always quarantine a new horse so whilst you're considering the, the various options for the questions you've got there I thought I'd just do a very brief introduction to World Horse Welfare, which was founded in 1927. And at the heart of the charity is very much about supporting the horse-human partnership. We support the responsible use of horses in sport and advise sport regulators around the world. We run the largest equine rescue and rehoming service in Britain, but we also work in 16 countries across the world where working equids are still very much part of uh, supporting human livelihoods. And we provide care, we promote research, we shape laws, and we raise welfare standards through education. And of course, that is so important of why we're running these webinar series, because they, they focus on a number of topics that we believe, um, and we've been told, that are really important to owners. Now, today's topic is all about protecting our horses from disease. Now, clearly disease is something that's been on the front page of our newspapers and the websites ever since um, COVID-19 hit the headlines. So it is very relevant because so much of what we've been told to how to protect ourselves against coronavirus is so relevant as how we should be protecting our horses. Because we often think it's easy to think that equine disease is someone else's problem. It's for those horses that maybe we take in to World Horse Welfare Centres. But actually, equine disease can affect any horse, whether it's a small Shetland or a millionaire thoroughbred, they're all at risk of very much the same diseases and with the same impacts. But at World Horse Welfare, we understand the challenges of horse owners we all have in juggling. And it's often easy to think that protecting our horses from disease is such a difficult thing to do. And that's why I'm delighted to welcome Richard and Tony with us tonight, because I hopefully we will end up understanding that some really practical ways that we can start protecting our horses if we're not already doing so this evening from um, the, the, th the growing threat of equine disease. So before I move on to Richard, I just wanted to see if um, we've managed to get the answer to the poll. Do we think it is important to always quarantine a new horse? Ah, excellent. I've never seen that before. There's always someone who goes for the other options, but we've got a very informed <laughs> audience tonight, which is great. Um, but it gets more challenging later on. So that's a, a nice, easy opener for you all. So that's great to hear. So I'm delighted to um, introduce Dr. Richard Newton, who graduated from the great University of Liverpool back in 1991. He spent a couple of years in mixed animal pr practice and has been at the Animal Health Trust since 1994. My maths is no good, but that's quite a long time. And in that time, he is going to be a renowned global expert in equine disease, disease prevention and control and indeed I think Richard's obviously got lots of times to change this but if his epitaph was going to be written today I think it would be how Richard coped with the media and the pressure of the equine influenza outbreak in the UK of 2019. He's a member of various disease advisory groups to the thoroughbred world, the sport world, and is also a part of the UK Equine Disease Coalition, and is currently Director of Epidemiology and Disease Surveillance 
at the Animal Health Trust. There is no one better uh, able to give us an overview on how we can better protect our horses. And Richard, even this morning, we were talking just now that there was an outbreak of equine influenza at a yard. And what really uh, amazed me last year was that so many of those outbreaks were in animals that were unvaccinated, which had recently come into a new yard. And so it shows that there really is so much for us to learn. And, and Richard, delighted to welcome you here this evening. Thank you very much, Rowley. Um, I'll just uh, see if I can share my screen. Um, okay, let me just move to the screen here. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Rowley, for the introduction. Um, yeah, 26 years is a long time. Um, and I sometimes do wonder what the hell I've done with my time, but uh, it was very kind of you to say those, those kind words. So really following the brief today, I, I, I really just want to try and put a bit of practical um, advice together and give the audience some things to think about. Think about effective strategies for equine pre premises, how they may prevent and control uh, infectious disease. As we're all aware with, with COVID, this is a massive evolving uh, subject and I'm not going to cover it in the 15 or 20 minutes that I'm going to be speaking to you, but hopefully there'll be some um, thought provoking stuff that we can think about. So in overview, I want to talk about some general principles um, and really just assure people that it is really a, a, a lot of common sense uh, rather than high level science. Um, I'm going to just touch on a few slides looking at the basics of factors that people should think about with, with diseases and how they behave within populations. I'm not going to cover specific diseases but be happy to answer questions on those if, if required. And then really for the main part of the talk, talk about practical steps to reduce the risk of infectious disease whilst horses are at home uh, but also whilst attending events and also the thought of introducing uh, disease after uh, attending that event. Because mixing and moving of horses does allow these infections to move uh, with them and to um, infect new populations of horses as they go, very much as we've been seeing with, with COVID and, and humans. So the basic concept, the real message that I want to get over today is that prevention is better than cure. And whilst we might think of vaccines and operating quarantines as expensive and time consuming and hard to operate, they really are insurance policies against introduction of disease. And I think that's a good way to think of them. I think it's good if people can take the time to understand your enemy. What are the diseases and multiple diseases that uh, you may come up against? They're not all the same and they don't all behave the same way. And therefore, the control strategies are not all the same. Um, I'm a great advocate for people getting into good habits, routinely recording clinical signs. Um, I think that's a valuable tool. Um, and the key word there is recording, taking the temperature uh, regularly, writing that down in a diary, then you're able to see if a horse is uh, moving away from what is its normal temperature. I think where that happens, taking early action can pay big dividends. Don't be afraid to seek veterinary assistance. And also where that vet recommends taking samples and conducting laboratory testing, that again can be very important in order to manage a, a situation early and in the best way. Perhaps it's easy to say, but we're, we're, we're probably a lot more conscious of this now following COVID, but I think keeping yourself or keeping your horse to itself whilst you're away from home at events is a sensible thing to do. And also big advocate of taking responsibility, acting responsibly, uh, reporting, not being afraid to put your head above the parapet when you've got a problem, We've seen some great practice with outbreaks where people have said, we've got this problem, we're closing our doors and we're going to sort it out. And that, that is really is good, good responsible horse ownership. But I just want people to consider the concept that if we're going to control a disease within a population, such as a horse population, then the most effective control will come when we thoroughly understand how that disease may well be behaving. And that's just another way of, do we understand the epidemiology of that disease? So in that, we have to think of a number of factors that may contribute to how uh, a disease may, may behave. What's the source of the infection? Is it the horse itself? Is it somewhere, is it something else? Is it an insect, for example? 
what are the routes of transmission? Is it coming from the respiratory tract? Is it coming from somewhere else? Uh, in order to um, prevent disease, we need to know where those infections are actually coming from. We think of carriers. These are animals that are infectious, but may not outwardly look like they're in infected. And we need to be aware of those with some diseases. Latent infections are those where the, the animal may be carrying an infection, but only at certain times is it actually infectious. Again, understanding those are important. Different diagnostic methods can be used. And again, these are worth discussing with the vet if you do have to call them out to look at the problem. Biosecurity is a scary word, but it's actually quite simple, really. It's all the security about biological processes and thinking about hygiene. And again, we're much more um, familiar with that now with respect to how we go about protecting ourselves from COVID. I also like people to think about, well, what's the prospect that I can actually eradicate, get rid of this infection from my horse, from the population in which it lives, and then think about how I can prevent it coming back. And that obviously entails looking at um, vaccination as a, as a tool. So moving on to practical steps, um, I want to really get people to think about how to reduce the risk of acquiring and spreading infections at these different stages. Obviously, animals, um, horses are kept at home, they're cared for at home. And when I say home, that could be a mixed yard of, of, of different owners, different vets, um, or it may be a single horse at, literally at home. Horse owners like to do things with their animals. That's really the raison d'etre for having them. And therefore, what are the risks whilst people are doing things with their horses? They may well be attending an event, a gathering. They're doing something with their animal away from home. And obviously, where there is a risk of acquiring an infection at an event, at a gathering, when that animal comes home, that may well pose uh, a risk um, in bringing it home. So we need to think about that as well. So whilst at home, I touched on this earlier, I think taking the temperature routinely, ideally twice a day and recording that along with any other unusual signs such as a nasal discharge or a cough or a discharge from the eye, swellings, that sort of thing, that's a good habit to get into. And by keeping a diary of those, you will establish what the norm is, the normal is for your animal. And when uh, a temperature spikes above that, that can be one of the earliest signs that anybody picks up in terms of uh, an early sign of an infectious disease. At that point, it should be uh, that the animal has started to show clinical signs. Isolate that animal away from others. Doing that early can really prevent big problems. And at that point, if that temperature continues and other signs develop, then think about calling the vet in early, getting a veterinary clinical examination and, and taking that investigation further. On examination, the veterinary surgeon may suspect that there is an infectious disease um, evident, um, and that would be particularly true if other start signs are starting to manifest when, when the clinical examination takes place. It's important to say that the vet may well talk about that sample, taking samples for laboratory testing will be really helpful in ruling in or helpfully ruling out what certain diagnoses may be. A raised temperature is a very non-specific sign. A lot of diseases, infectious diseases, will give that as an early sign. So going looking for what's causing it can be really important because knowing what that causative agent is, bacteria or virus, may well be very helpful for informing the next steps, the appropriate management of that case. Really important message is not, once you've got an infectious disease, it's not a very good idea to start moving animals away from those affected premises to other premises where there could be horses. Outwardly healthy animals may well be incubating that infection before they start to develop signs themselves, and that action can then spread that infection quite readily. So taking responsibility, isolating on the premises, but not moving other animals is really important. Also, observing practical and effective hygiene and, and biosecurity at all times. Use of uh, disinfectant, um, dedicated equipment, taking care when you have visitors onto a premises, especially if they've got contact with horses at home, they may inadvertently be carrying infections from those animals to your, to your own animal. Um, I think it's important with your vet probably to risk assess the use of vaccination for different diseases. The next slide I, I will cover
that it's not that all vaccines have to be given to all horses, different situations require different use of vaccination. And also I will quickly cover considering the use of quarantine for new arrivals. Quarantine is different to isolation. Quarantine you apply to outwardly healthy animals that may or may not be incubating a disease, but you're giving, uh, you're, you're stopping the opportunity if they are, of then that spreading. And also there may be application of screening laboratory tests that help with that um, risk of bringing in a carrier animal, for example. So the list, this list here is really the vaccines that are used in horses in the UK. The list in America will be a lot longer, but this is the list that we have. Tetanus should be there for all horses. It's a fatal disease and it, it should be used without question. Flu, as last year, as Roly mentioned, 2019 was a very big year for influenza. Um, and moving and mixing of horses, particularly where they weren't vaccinated, was a big driver for, for, for that epidemic. So therefore, animals that are being used like that should be vaccinated. EHV, herpes virus, one and four, is particularly important for pregnant mares, but there are other scenarios where it's important as well. Strangles, the only vaccine that's available at the moment, is a little bit controversial and may be used in the face of an endemic infection. So a chronic infection on a premises that, that's not going away. EVA is a very specialist vaccine, really used only for breeding stallions. West Nile virus we don't have in this country, but if you're traveling horses to affected areas, it's worth thinking about. Foaling mares on affected farms may well benefit from rotavirus vaccine. And Lawsonia is actually a pig vaccine, but may well be used for foals on affected farms. So thinking about an example of quarantine and screening, we're, we're bringing in horses that we've just purchased. We don't know anything about them. We, we think that there may be a risk that something may come in with them. Ideally, a three to four week quarantine period to allow disease to manifest if it's there and also to conduct screening. We may want to do a blood test for strangles, for example. That first test taken early in quarantine, we look at that. If that result is negative, we retest them two weeks later. That allows time for that uh, result to come back. If they're negative, at the end of quarantine, they've shown no clinical signs suggested of strangles, then they're safe to enter the herd as far as uh, we can tell. Sometimes, however, that early blood test does come back positive, suggesting the horse at some time has been exposed to the organism. We then recommend that a more invasive guttural pouch endoscopy be conducted. We're looking for the presence of strep equi. If we don't find that, then at that point, yes, it's seropositive, but the animal is safe to enter the herd. But if it's positive and we identify the presence of the strangles organism, then that allows us safely within quarantine to treat and retest and hopefully get that animal safely into the herd. So what about whilst we're at an event? The mantra of keeping yourself to yourself, I think, is relevant. Avoiding direct contact between horses uh, uh, will prevent that direct transmission of infection, with which some horses may be carrying. Also, in direct contact, humans moving between individual horses at events can transmit. Um, so an extension of that is obviously not sharing equipment that can act as a fomite or carry that infection between animals and obviously a good habits to get into a good hygiene practices and wherever possible using personal protective equipment that that's absolute gold standard so we have at the HT um, and this first one was, was was on the back of the flu outbreak giving advice to people in terms of what to do with your animals before and whilst you're at events and then what to do when, when you come back. So rather cartoonish, but hopefully the messages are pretty clear when, when, when you're able to, to look at that. One that was very much dedicated to the flu were these messages, the, the five key protocols, vaccinating, isolating animals, communicating what was going on, investigating sick animals, but also investigating um, what gatherings required in terms of vaccination, etc and generally risk assessing and mitigating against um, introducing and spreading infection. So what about after returning from an event? Well, I mean, it's the same principles. If it can be done, it can pay dividends. If you can have some form of quarantine for horses returning from events. So quarantine, as I've said, is the isolation of animals that are potentially incubating the infections that they required at those events. Ideally, in this situation, two to three weeks, I think probably would be ideal. You're not necessarily going to be testing those animals if they're clinically um, well. 
And the basic equation is that the, if you don't adopt quarantine or it's short and you don't have good biosecurity, then basically the risk is then higher uh, of introducing infection that was acquired at that event back to those resident horses that you're reintroducing those animals to. So what does an effective quarantine look like? Well, we might think that it's, um, it needs to be fancy and expensive, and it doesn't. It's based on physical separation from resident animals, and probably 10 to 20 meters is absolutely fine for most infections. Um, and you don't necessarily need a dedicated facility. You can adopt existing arrangements for this. End boxes with an end with a separate box with a little bit of tape can indicate that that animal is in quarantine for a period of time. Ideally, you would use separate dedicated staff and equipment to look after those animals for a period, therefore avoiding indirect transmission. And if that's not at all possible, then just dealing with the horses in quarantine after you've dealt with the resident horses will prevent that transmission risk in, in that particular direction. And really, this is just a repeat, so you can see how important I think this is. Routine temperature recording, noting of clinical signs, in order to identify cases that may be bringing infection back in after an event. Don't be afraid to request that veterinary examination. Um, looking for other clinical signs, the fever, the nasal discharge, coughing, and in the worst case scenarios, you may have an animal that's um, incoordinated or with neurological signs, or, or God forbid, uh, there is an abortion, a, a pregnant mare losing, losing the foal. And undertaking sampling and laboratory testing can give you uh, an idea of what's going on. That may be, say, a swab for an infectious agent, or it may be that you take a pair of blood samples and look for rising antibody levels while they're in quarantine. And I put in here about noting, notifying the event organisers. Um, that can actually be really important if it's been a large event and uh, a significant disease may have uh, spread whilst, or an infection may have spread whilst at that. And we have had over the years a number of examples, and especially in North America, though they have very large gatherings, neurological EHV has spread on a number of occasions and then been transmitted quite readily onto, onto new premises. So finally, I just want to talk about where, where do you go for sources of information? And these concepts are promoted through uh, various initiatives. Uh, and I've just put a few of them, them here. The steps, guidelines produced by the BHS, um, still very relevant, particularly for, for strangles. These two I've been involved with over the years, the National Trainers Federation Code of Practice for Infectious Disease, Racehorses and Training, and also now the International HBLB Codes of Practice. Uh, they have bags of information um, uh, about a wide range of diseases and they've been brought together actually with a freely available um, app for both uh, iPhones and Androids uh, and that's called EquiBioSafe and that can be freely downloaded and it contains all the information that's contained uh, within those two codes and gives some really good sensible advice and builds on everything that I've talked about here. So that's it for me. I will hand over now to uh, Roly. I'll stop the share. And um, thank you very much. Richard, thank you so much for that. We've actually started getting some really good questions about do I need to vaccinate my older horse? Is it fair to quarantine horses? Um, and um, in terms of how you can practical things of keeping your horses away from um, each other at an event. So lots to come back to in the Q&A, but Richard, thank you for that. That was a, that was a, a great introduction and, and, and run through. I know there's a huge amount that goes underneath that. Um, and um, it's, it's one of the issues also is the issue of trying to, you mentioned there about being a bit more open, because you know, when people start to talk about strangles, they often sort of, you know, it's seen as the plague and, and, and no one wants to talk about it. And actually so often the reactions and the behaviors that people as a result of that is completely opposite of what they should do. So it, it would be really good to come back and talk about that. So I look forward to that. Now, um, I'm going to just start sharing my screen again, um, assuming I can do that. Um, and uh, we've got another, before I, I asked, um, well, I think, I think we've got another, if, if I can get back to it. Um, there we go. Um, 
do you normally use the term biosecurity um, when talking about horse health? So do you normally use the word biosecurity when talking about horse health? There's a number of answers there that you can give. So give that some, um, as Richard said, it's a scary term. And I think that's a really good way of putting it because people uh, do tend to think of uh, people in white suits when, when you talk about biosecurity. But, um, and, but it's so often used when we talk about, um, you know, how we can keep our horses safe. So um, whilst you're considering that, I thought I would introduce our next speaker. I'm delighted to, to introduce Tony, who's uh, been with the charity a long time. He's been with, um, with, with the horse industry even longer and has been a freelance trainer, BHS chief examiner and a senior college lecturer. Known once or twice to get on a horse um, and has been a, a fairly uh, effective horse rider in his time. And he's um, been deputy chief executive and director of uh, the UK work of uh, World Horse Welfare since 2008. And in that regard, obviously this year has been a really interesting year and challenging year like it has been for so many. But I'm delighted to say that Tony has driven forward uh, with the team, the, the, our four rescue and rehoming centres, who are now all um, uh, rehoming, and we, it's, we, we've got a number of horses and ponies ready for rehoming through our website. So I would um, implore you to go if you're thinking about um, a, a, a new horse or pony, then do go and look at World Horse Welfare website or the other charity websites because it can so often be so much better to rehome rather than buy a horse because the best thing about it is if you rehome a horse from World Horse Welfare or one of the charities that means that we will then be able to help another horse that's in great need and this coming winter we are anticipating a huge need. So having introduced Tony and, and just spoken a little bit about our rehoming scheme, I'm hoping we'll have an answer to our question around whether people use the term biosecurity. And actually the vast majority do. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a term I use a lot, um, uh, nearly half, and then about a third saying um, they, talk it, they use it uh, when talking about equine disease. Uh, but then nearly a fifth say, no, it's not a word I would normally use. That's a considerable number. Um, actually, and it's, but it's interesting that no one is confused or scared by the term. Uh, that, that tells me that we've got a fairly informed audience um, on our hands because it, for some people it most certainly does. So Tony, I'm going to hand over to you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and um, I will look forward to, to speaking to you again once we're uh, um, for the question and answer session. Tony. Thanks very much, Roly. And first of all, my thanks to Richard. You will hear some repetition of what Richard has said in, in, in how I talk tonight, but this is one of those subjects where constant reminders are useful. And one of the things I'd say is how many of us are still washing our hands as much as you did at the start of the pandemic. So just thinking constantly about biosecurity is important. Some of the things that will go on, the, on our discussion points to start with. What actually is biosecurity? Why is it important to us? And I'll talk a little bit about our own experience at the farms and also some of the things that we've learnt and what you can do. And then I'll finish up with key points to remember. So just thinking about biosecurity, as has been said, to some people find it quite a scary word. I actually did mention the word to a friend the other night and they thought I was talking about precautions similar, similar to those taken after the Salisbury poisoning. But this is, really is something that's relevant to all horse owners. Over the years, riding has increased in popularity and horses have moved much longer distances than ever before. Because of this increased movement of horses, they're exposed to a greater risk. And when an outbreak occurs, in some cases, a lockdown in of movement in an area is re required. Some of the herd groups we take in as welfare cases have been sold several times between individuals, new horses added and literally moved from one end of the country to the other. So thinking a little bit about biosecurity at our farms, we have over 320 horses at any one time across our farms with regular comings of new horses or going to those of those who have found a new home to go to. As you can see from this picture, they adopt a similar approach to humans on Bournemouth Beach when it comes to social distancing. With so much near continual move, movement of horses, 
and some of those horses coming from dire situations where disease is present, you'd expect that we regularly experience disease outbreaks or that would be at high risk. But we're not. And this isn't because we are lucky. It's because we have strict but simple procedures for how we deal and help with horses and how we manage our horses when they come in to reduce the risk of an infectious disease outbreak. So at our farms themselves, we're very lucky in that we have four independent isolation units. And given the numbers that we've come in, for us, this is essential. We'd find it extremely difficult to survive without them. But it's perfectly possible to isolate horses um, thinking about new arrivals and returns, it's perfectly possible to isolate horses and um, quarantine them out in a field, to quarantine them in an individual box. It can be challenging, but there are lots of ways that you can make it easier. Whilst in quarantine, each horse or group of horses has its own separate equipment, its own hay nets, its own water source, and they cannot come into contact with any other horses unless they came in as part of a group. It can be a tough time for both the horse and our staff, but normally we keep them in view of other horses. Being, social, being socially isolated comes with its challenges, but we know these challenges are worth it and much easier to deal with than dealing with a disease outbreak across the farms. During quarantine, horses will undergo regular veterinary health checks to try and identify if they have any infectious diseases. For example, Richard spoke about the need to take temperatures on a regular basis. And before horses come, in, come out of quarantine, we do test the strangles and ensure that they are negative. So horses on our farms, they have a continual daily health check we do get scares, but as I've already said, there are protocols in place that mean that all staff know immediately what action to take. When we hold events to our farms, no unknown horse is able to come into contact with one of our own farm horses. We keep our vaccinations up to date, and if any concerns are flagged by the staff, then we will immediately isolate that horse or the group of horses from all others. Thinking about our horses, obviously the prime aim with them is then to go on and be rehomed. And it's always a very rewarding moment for the, for the charity when a horse can actually go out to a new home. It's after all what we're aiming for with all, all of our horses. But prior to that, we make sure that they've had a thorough vet check. And if, again, if there are any concerns whatsoever, we may repeat blood tests. So, what do we know about how biosecurity is influenced? From the research that we've carried out, we know that biosecurity is better on yards who have experienced a disease outbreak. And it makes common sense, really. If you've been on a yard and you've had to experience the, the stress and the trauma of a strangles case or anything like that, then it's common sense that the yard will start to be more aware and take more precautions. We also know that for some reason people do have a bit of a fear of taking a horse's temperature. And one of the things that we've done at World Horse Welfare is we do have some information on our website with a video showing you exactly how to do it. Whilst it's encouraging to know that lessons are being learnt on the yards, we feel that it's imperative that all owners truly understand there is a real disease risk facing our horses in the UK. So what can you actually do at your yard? Anything is better than nothing. And that's the first thing to remember. People say, oh, it's not worth me doing that. But yes, it is. Yes, it's worth you making sure that people do stay away from a new horse. Some things that you can do. Simplest of all is to ensure that everybody on the yard knows that a new horse is in quarantine. This can obviously be done with signs, it can be done by verbal communication, but the other things that we've suggested is things like putting barriers around the horse's box, 
keeping a, at least one empty box between the new horse on the yard and another if you don't have a designated isolation area. And some yards have even gone to the extent, much as you're seeing in supermarkets and things like that at the moment, of putting tape or a paint floor marking near the door areas that helps to make people aware and keep people away from your horse. People are very, very tempted to go and give a new horse a cuddle, particularly if it's a youngster or particularly if it's a foal. But of course, they could then be the conduit for disease transmission. If a horse's field, it, if horses in the field are isolated or getting daily turnout, one of the other things that's important is to remember not to let it share water troughs with others, to make sure that those people going to get the horses and to take them in and out do them in a sensible order. So the key points to remember from, from what we do at our yards, we quarantine all new arrivals. We keep to up to date up with vaccinations. We do know our horses' normal temperatures, their respirations and pulses, and we take them on a regular basis. And one of the things I would say is that not every horse's normal temperature is the same. So you do need to take that temperature for a period of time to make sure that you know what your horse's normal temperature actually is. You, we don't let unknown horses come into direct con contact and if do not share equipment between horses and what equipment you do use make sure you disinfect it afterwards and really that's the that's the key points all of the other things Richard has covered in his talk we can't stress enough that every little helps make sure that people are aware that biosecurity is important make sure that people are aware that if they don't pay attention to it they are risking not only the health of their own horses but the health of others very much as we're having to do with the covid virus today and that covers most of my points off really that's very unlike you, Tony. That was very on time. I, I, I was very, very impressed with that. That's great. So listen, we've got um, um, plenty of time for questions. Um, and so thank you, firstly, to Richard and Tony. There's plenty of food for thought there. And we've got a number of questions coming in. But please do keep the questions coming in so we can make best use of, of Tony and Richard. Um, and as Tony mentioned, um, temperature taking was mentioned by both Tony and Richard. And there's a, there's a, a great video on the World Horse Welfare website and just picking up on the information that Richard mentioned in his talk. Uh, there's some great uh, resources there. And th there's a disease pack which you can download from the World Horse Welfare website as well, which gives a lot of practical information uh, and understanding of the different diseases. And as Richard said, it, it is important that we understand uh, the different diseases. Clearly tetanus, flu, and strangles is one that are three diseases that um, hopefully many of us will be very familiar with, hopefully not firsthand, but um, it is, um, there are a number of other issues uh, and diseases and with global warming, uh, we, uh, we, we know that the number of potential exotic diseases that, that we're at risk at, uh, of is, is significantly increasing. So um, let's kick off um, one of the questions, and I love this, anything is better than nothing. And Tony, you also, also used the catchphrase, I thought you were advertising a supermarket there for, for a while. Uh, but um, it is, I think that probably is the mantra of this whole, of this whole talk, because we recognise that any, any efforts to protect our whole from disease does take a bit of effort on our part. But um, as both speakers have so eloquently said, it really is... Um, worth the investment. Now, uh, Richard, I'll come to you first. Um, old horses, do they need vaccinating? Uh, short answer, yes. Um, we know that um, by, by following horses that have been vaccinated, um, the, the, the immunity does not last forever. Um, some very old horses can have, um, their, their immune systems do start to not be as efficient, so it is important to keep those animals vaccinated. Um, the flu outbreak in 2019 definitely showed us that um, uh, this idea that my horse doesn't go anywhere, therefore I don't need to vaccinate it, is, is, is not right. Because if you introduce that infection 
uh, and that animal has not been vaccinated. It's particularly true with, with old horses. They can be particularly badly affected uh, if they if they do get 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 sick. So um, certainly for flu, um, you do need to think at the population level. And, and you know, people have talked with COVID about herd immunity. Um, it's particularly true for a highly infectious disease like equine influenza that as much of that population is vaccinated in order to uh, keep that infection out. Thank you, uh, Richard. I mean, obviously, we're thinking, I'm always telling people don't anthropomorphize, don't think of people. But when we talk of going to the doctors, they say for tetanus, for example, actually, if you've had uh, a good series of um, boosters, then that, that immunity does last a, a long time. Is that, for tetanus, is that the same with horses? Is there any sort of decreased need in older horses to vaccinate against tetanus? Or is that maintained throughout a horse's life as well? Um, I, I think the problem with tetanus is it, it, it's a highly effective vaccine. And as long as you do it properly in the early stages, um, then probably that that is an exception it's a it's a different disease than just meeting the infection you're actually um it's the toxin produced deep within the wound that causes the problem um so it's a it's a different problem if you like the the problem with tetanus is that um nobody's looked many many years after a vaccination uh, and therefore the vaccines can't make a claim that five ten years down the line I'm, they're still protected so you have to really go with what the data sheet, what the manufacturers are putting out there. So it may be every two or, or, or three years, um, then you have to you have to revaccinate. But tetanus is kind of the exception. It, it hopefully, you know, you very rarely will see tetanus in, in animals that have been properly vaccinated early in their life. Um, and therefore it's, you know, and it's it's fatal. So why wouldn't you want to do it? Absolutely. So, Tony, obviously at World Horse Welfare, we have a, a lot of old horses. How do we approach vaccination? We, we vaccinate all of our old horses for, for flu and tetanus as usual. Um, for, for the older horse, they would generally receive the flu vaccination on a yearly basis. Obviously, for horses that are being rehomed on a competition front or anything like that, then they would need to go for the six months. Excellent. Um, Richard, obviously last year there was the, the, the big outbreak of equine influenza, but as we just heard uh, earlier, you know, the, there's an underlying, it's an endemic disease, it's, it's in the UK the whole time. Um, and um, so the, you, I always grew up saying that you had to vaccinate your horses annually. And then last year, the, the, um, I know that sports bodies, a number had moved before last year, but then the clear indication was that we should be vaccinating every six months. And of course, then COVID has come this year and actually access to veterinary services were, were challenging for a while. Um, and so some uh, regulators said, no, it can, it can go out to a longer period. Are we still, are you still recommending every six months for uh, equine influenza vaccinations? Yeah, bro bro broadly, yes. And, and COVID, as you say, has introduced an interesting dynamic into it. Um, and that's because some animals now will have gone longer than our recommended six months. There's, there's a lot of studies out there where we've looked at natural outbreaks and time and time again, it's, it's when you get into that six to 12 months since last vaccination where the disease starts to creep in. Um, the other issue is that the strains of virus obviously evolve naturally and we don't update va horse vaccines as frequently as we do say for human flu vaccines. So you're getting this drift away from what's in the vaccine. And we know from a number of different types of study that you do reach a, a point where your vaccines work much less well where that's the case. So there's a lot of arguments for animals that are mixing and then moving uh, back to home premises to keep those animals um, well vaccinated and ideally within six months of, of, of that last vaccination. And you're probably aware because you advise them yourselves, the FEI introduced this many, many years ago and it wasn't every six months was the rule, it was within six months of going to that competition. And that, I guess, is the, the important message. It's the within six months of the high risk period where you may meet that infection will give your horse population the best chance that that infection is not going to break through vaccination. 
but we do reach some points where uh, the virus has evolved so efficiently and so well that it will break through vaccination. That's what we want to try and avoid. Brilliant. There are lots of questions coming through around vaccination, so we'll stick on that theme for the moment. I, I wanted to come back, Richard, in a second to the strangled vaccine that you mentioned earlier. But th this is a question I know you hear a lot of. Many people are scared of bad reactions to vaccinations. How can you reassure us? Um, uh, Richard, w w what's your initial view on that? Um, yeah, I, I, I understand that. Um, the... I, I guess the reassurance is a, a lot of work goes in in the very early stages that people perhaps are not aware of in developing safe safe vaccines. Um, we've come a long way in the development of those vaccines over the years in terms of the way that they're made up, uh, what actually goes into them, how horses will react to them. Uh, it's not by accident that we use a long needle um, to deposit these vaccines deep within the muscle because that allows the uh, the horse to, to see that vaccine and, and, and mount a, an immune response. So it's a real balancing act between how the horse reacts when it sees the vaccine uh, versus, you know, the vaccine doing its job and developing good immunity in, in that animal. Um, there are formal ways that adverse reactions are recorded. Um, they're probably an underestimate, uh, and that's through the veterinary medicines directorate. So I would advocate where horse owners uh, do have an adverse reaction um, that they get their veterinary surgeon to report that to VMD uh, and the data from the VMD does say that adverse reactions do occur but at a very very low level um, and the ma vaccine manufacturers will take that um, that data seriously and they will investigate if they are made aware of it um, so it is an important factor but I think it is a, at a, a low level and it is monitored um, uh, going, going forward. That's a great point about actually getting people to report where there are reactions, because then we can understand a bit more. Tony, obviously, uh, World Horse Welfare vaccinates lots and lots of horses and ponies. Um, uh, are we, do we get many reactions? It, it's extremely rare. Uh, uh, as you said at the start, I've been with the charity 20 years. In that time, I've seen thousands of vaccinations literally and I could count on one hand of the number of times that we've seen an adverse reaction. Um, I'm quite good at maths you've been at the charity 21 years but uh, there you go. I'll, I'll, um, <laughs> so and it's interesting Richard because um, I was in Australia it seems like a lifetime away ago but it was only in in February and obviously there's a there's a disease called the Hendra virus down there which is it, which is not good because it affects horses and humans and can be fatal and there is a vaccine for that but actually uptake of the Hendra virus in Australia is quite low because of this um, and I think it is a perception um, of, the, of, of bad reactions to the vaccine and that really can impact people so I think it's, it is very important that we we can reassure people that it is safe. Yes, no, absolutely. I, I do find the Hendra situation slightly, um, slightly, well, alarming might not be the right word, but 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 bemusing, probably not the right word either. But um, as you've said, uh, it does affect humans, and where humans have been affected, including veterinary surgeons, um, they have caught it off horses that have been infected out out, out in the field. So. My view of the Hendra virus vaccine in horses is that's a public health, a human public health intervention in order to protect horse owners and veterinary surgeons. And um, it's, uh, there are veterinary surgeons no longer practicing now in certain parts of Australia, and that's probably due to fears over Hendra virus. So, you know, I, I, in terms of responsibility, I, I think having your horse vaccinated against Hendra is protecting the horse, which is great, but it's also protecting all the humans uh, uh, around the care of that animal as well. Absolutely. Um, uh, I certainly don't want to confuse things, and I might, I might have feared, because there's someone who's come in and said, with so many diseases out there, how can I vaccinate against them all? And, you, and Richard, you put up a, quite a series of of uh of diseases now obviously not relevant to all horse owners and but i think are, are we saying um for the general horse population 
um, that tetanus and flu are the, the sort of the fundamentals and then the others are possibles. Yeah, I think so. The Americans talk about core vaccines. Their list is a lot longer than, than it would be in the UK, thankfully, because we don't have some of those um, viral pathogens that, that they do over here. Um, there's one on that list called West Nile virus, and we, we thankfully don't have that. We ha it's there in mainland Europe, um, and that may change over time with climate change, and if that infection becomes established, again, don't want to scare people. Um, but we've been aware of that in Europe since certainly the 1960s and the virus was only first recognised in, in the late 1930s. So uh, things change uh, and therefore we have to change our approach to how we, how we do. But, but I think you're right, tetanus and, and flu. And part of that table that I put up there was really to outline how, depending what animals you've got, what they use for, if you like, um, what class they are, that will dictate which vaccines you need to think about. And there probably isn't an animal anywhere that would require all of that list to, 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 to be administered. And Tony, uh, flu and tetanus for World Total Welfare? So, sorry, is it just flu and tetanus that we would be um, vaccinating at World Total Welfare? Yes, that's all, that's all we use at the moment. Brilliant. Um, Richard, one um, a question here is a very good question. One of the younger horses on our small yard attends local events and then returns to our yard of six owners with their horses in part livery. So you've got some horses uh, going off and some horses not going off, going off the yard. Our horses are turned out together in small groups. Should those of us who don't have our horses leave the yard, mostly older horses, have vaccinations every six months too? So you've got competition horses that require every six months, but then you've got horses back at the yard that don't compete, and therefore there's no requirement from a competition perspective. But it, from a disease perspective, should they be vaccinated every six months too? Um, yeah, I, again, I, I think the short answer is yes, because they become a bubble, a population um, at risk if those animals come back with 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 influenza um, and that can happen at a subclinical level so they can acquire the infection the vaccine is doing a good job in preventing signs but there's still infection present and if you've got a uh, part of your population that's not so well vaccinated they can act as what we would call sentinels they can pick up that infection if they're less well vaccinated they will actually go down with disease more more severely and the most extreme of that is if you've got elderly uh, animals that are not vaccinated at all, then they can get really sick because of what somebody else has brought back onto the yard. Inadvertently, not deliberately, but that, that, that is what can happen. And we know with flu that that virus can spread further than other pathogens, further than herpes, strangles, uh, and therefore distance is not altogether a protection when it comes to flu. So having your resident population that is at risk consistently vaccinated more frequently is the gold standard way to do it. Thank you. Uh, Tony, uh, World Horse Welfare Advocacy has about 2,000, almost 2,000 horses out in homes around the country. What, what, what requirement or advice do we give them? You've put yourself, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no. it, well, for, for anything that is going out and about and, vi and, and visiting up shows or other horses, then we advocate the six monthly vaccinations. Many of our horses are literally just companions to other horses that never go anywhere. And so then we do accept the annual boosters. But as Richard says, really a six monthly booster would be the gold standard. And that's an interesting point there, Richard. This is talking about risk, isn't it? And it's, it's about, um, obviously, vaccinations uh, are a help of reducing risk. And there are some horses that are going to be a higher risk. And with that previous question is a really good example of that. So we need to start thinking about, you know, uh, making sensible judgments about the risk that we're taking. Yeah, very much. Yes, it, it all sounds scary, almost as scary as biosecurity when you talk about risk assessment and risk management. But that's what people are doing all the time. Um, and they just need to be, think of it as a balance. If I do this, what does that how does that tip uh the, the the likelihood that i've got got disease and 
you know, I, I, I can't argue with people that say, well, I can afford to do my horses annually, but I really can't afford to do it well. That's okay, but then think about the the, the risk if, if if something should should happen. Um, and you know, we sometimes talk about with um, with neurological EHB, people want want to turn to herpes virus vaccination straight away, and that's interesting because that's the time when we will often say, no, don't do that. Invest your time and money in um, other ways to control this outbreak initially. And then think about vaccination being introduced when everything's settled down as a preventive measure in, in the future. So people think of vaccination and vaccines in different ways. They want that emergency, get me through it, but that's not always, always relevant. Although interesting with flu, uh, we have data from large outbreaks, such as we saw in Newmarket a number of years ago, where actually if you've got a population that's a big size, so you know, yourselves at World Horse Welfare or other rescue centres, if you can get in there and vaccinate those animals early when you know you've got infection, then it can certainly limit the, the size ultimately of the, uh, of the outbreak. Thank you. There's some great questions and thank you so much for everyone sending them in. Um, I've had a note here that we've got people in Colombia and Cambodia listening in or watching in. Um, Aberdeen and Suffolk, I'm not sure quite what well, Aberdeen and Suffolk got, got, got a shout out, but we're, you're all very welcome where, wherever you are and please keep sending these questions in. Um, the question, of, Another question on laminitis around, um, is it safe to routinely vaccinate horses or ponies with laminitis? Richard, I'll put that one to you first. Uh, thank you, Rowley. Um, at this point, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge World Horse Welfare for the, um, uh, for the funding that you've put into two epidemiological studies of laminitis um, when, when we're at the Animal Health Trust. And in, in neither of those have we seen vaccination as a risk factor, as a, as a factor contributing to horses uh, having laminitis. There are a, a large number of potential risk factors but thankfully vaccination and routine healthcare like that is not um, is not a factor so we've not managed to link those two things thankfully so it should be possible to properly vaccinate um, horses at risk of laminitis without tipping them into anything um, anything too severe but uh, thank you Richard. I mean, Tony, just to add Rolly is uh, that, that from our experience in 2019 if if animals do get really severely sick with influenza then laminitis can be a consequence of that so it's probably very rare um, and it's probably to do with animals probably being uh, doing rather well but if they go down and are sick because of flu um, then then there can be problems with lam laminitis as a consequence so vaccination again is is got to be advocated and Tony, with the number of good doers, overweight, dare I say, obese horses coming into World Horse Welfare, does that impact, uh, and the risk of laminitis, obviously, does that impact our vaccination considerations at all? No, absolutely not. I would agree with Richard that uh, really, that as a risk factor, we've never seen any evidence whatsoever to suggest that there is a, a risk associated with vaccination, vaccinating them as normal. Brilliant. OK, well, we've done a lot of questions on vaccinations. And uh, if anyone has got any others, I, I hope I've covered most of them. But if I've missed any, then please do shout out again on the, on the chat box or on the on the, on the Facebook page. Um, it, there's a question from Helen. Um, if, if we're isolating a, a horse at grass or in a paddock, how many metres away from the other grazing horses does the isolated horse need to be? Is it 20 metres? I think you did refer to a, 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 a distance, Richard, didn't you? Uh, I, I, I did, but distances with um, quarantine and isolation and, and uh, it's a little bit how long is a piece of string. Um, and it's a bit like the COVID thing, but the longer you can make it, the risk reduces. Flu um, is the slight uh, exception in that it can travel longer distances. So probably 20 meters is not going to stop that if you've got um, a flu infected coughing horse at one end. Of your premises um, and, and, and a naive animal um, elsewhere. 20, 10 to 20 meters is, is really an ideal for, for most. The main thing is to stop that direct contact and allow a bit of distance that if there are signs that you're not going to get that, that transmission through aerosols 
or, or, or droplets um, occurring. So um, the main thing is uh, a number of meters. If you can do 20, that, that's great. If it's 10, that probably is sufficient. And if it's only five, that, that would be better than nothing. And you know, I like Tony's mantra, something is better than nothing. And Tony, I suppose, for, for World Tools Welfare, and you, you mentioned the, the isolation facilities or the quarantine facilities that World Tools Welfare has. Um, th they'd be considerably more than 20 metres, I suppose, would they? Yeah, when, when we field isolate, in the ideal world, what we'll leave is an empty paddock between fields that horses have got in. I think one of the most critical things that people do need to be aware of, where we've heard of people making mistakes, is when water troughs have been shared by horses, these troughs that go between fields. And, and uh, I mean, Richard would know far more than I do, but I gather that's a key transmitter for the strangles virus. Um, but if, if we can't separate by a full paddock, then we would put a, an electric fence in to keep them at least 20 metres away, if not more. Yeah, strangles obviously a bacteria, but um, absolutely. Um, so we... Um, in terms of quarantine and isolation, this uh, I've had a couple of questions tonight and it's something you hear so often that people think it's cruel um, and sometimes that's sort of that, that sort of passion around it. You know, the horses, Tony, you mentioned horses are social animals. So how can we isolate or quarantine them while still protecting their welfare? Obviously, that's going to protect their health, but is that going to protect their welfare? It, it varies on the individual horse as to what we will do, um, but when possible we'll keep the horse within sight of others and very often they're settled because of that. Now obviously there are some horses that actually the sight of others stirs them up even more and they'll be running up and down the fence lines to try and contact them. And in those cases, if necessary, we will put horses into stables or crew yards for a period of time. It's not ideal from a social point of view, but I, I would say it is more cruel to introduce the disease to other horses that that horse is potentially carrying. Interesting. So it's very much a balance. Uh, Richard, what, what would you be your take on that? Yeah, very much. Um, I, I think it's probably very easy for, <laughs> and I've been guilty of this over, over the years, of being rather dogmatic about the risk that the disease will pose and not think about the, well, the welfare of those animals. And I think it is really important that that is done. Um, I think, yes, this concept of sight and sound with other horses is, is probably a good one. And I would credit Gemma Pearson with um, putting that idea in, in, my, in my head, Gemma at um, Edinburgh. Uh, and I think it is something that we probably need to look at a little bit more carefully in terms of horse welfare more holistically when we're imposing these um, these restrictions on them for a period. Often we'll talk about companions, can we do them in pairs rather than uh, singles? Um, I know, you know, at the Animal Health Trust where, where we've had ponies over the years, we will buddy them up and, and, and you know, isolate them as a pair rather than a single. Um, there, there are probably other ways that we can more creatively solve these or, or go some way to alleviate these these welfare problems um, and just careful observation of animals understanding animals you know what are the stress signs are, are we doing more harm in terms of um, stressing them than, than, we, um, than, than, than we're getting benefit at least yeah I think that's a really interesting but really important point isn't it to, to actually read the signs and we talk about it, it's good horsemanship isn't it when you're riding to, to actually read the signs from your horse and, and it's good horsemanship in terms of how we manage them and, and Tony you talked about it there the fact that horses um, again I'm, I'll be challenged at being anthropomorphic but you know horses do have different personalities don't they and so some some are far more relaxed in you know being on their own than than others, and it's really important to be able to to monitor that and 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 change how we're managing them as a result. Absolutely, and of course, with with World Force Welfare, in almost the majority of cases now, it would be pairs or small groups of horses that come in, and so they would be kept together. Um, but, but an individual that comes in, we, we would look at that as an individual and see how it was reacting. This is a fascinating question, and Richard, I'll come to you first. Does, do owners have a legal responsibility to tell someone if they think their horse has a disease? Um, it probably falls into two categories. Um, 
There are what we call a group of diseases called notifiable diseases uh, that are viewed as being significant by the government and the industry. And therefore, there will be obligations under different types of uh, legislation. Um, and we can think of a, a number of those that we're particularly concerned about, which are happening in some parts of the world at the moment, which have not had that before. Thinking of African horse sickness. Um, and then there, there would be an obligation there. Um, other diseases, the endemic diseases that we that we live with and try and manage, um, in short, no, there isn't. I don't believe there is an obligation, but we try and instill um, that sort of acting responsibly. Um, we try and certainly if you read the codes, there's sections there about notifying breeding associations that you, you've, you've got a problem because actually you're doing that greater good. You are limiting the extent that uh, welfare issues will, will widen by you. Um, inadvertently or deliberately spreading spreading disease um, and therefore it's it's down to personal conscience I think um, you know are you an animal lover um, you you touched earlier on the stigma of, of strangles and um, you know a lot of work has gone into trying to break that 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 stigma it's actually much better to put your hand up say you've got strangles and and you know act responsibly and do something about it and you know, a number of disease outbreaks, we have seen people acting responsibly and, and actually, you know, done very well out of it, I think. Yes. Um, so, Tony, I mean, there's a there's the legal responsibility and, and Richard's talked about the notifiable diseases. But then in terms of the endemic, the, 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 the influenzas, the, the, the strangles, the, the moral responsibility. And there obviously clearly is a moral responsibility to do that because it's not only your own horse but it's the other horses around them sure we we have heard of instant incidences where people have knowingly moved moved horses with disease onto new yards and not told them and obviously that that's completely wrong really um no no yard would want to take a horse on with a disease unless they had some fairly strong isolation facilities themselves I think that there is a balance to be struck here in that obviously you want to tell people that are visiting your yard, if necessary, you want to close your yard down. But equally, um, so that the, the notices that people put out um, to try and make people aware of it, then it's again, it's about targeting the people who are at risk that is the important thing here. And I, I think making sure that people who, whose horses could be at risk by an outbreak on your yard is important. Richard, just touching back on vaccination, um, we've we talked a bit about strangles there, and you did mention very briefly the, uh, the strangles vaccination in your, or a strangles vaccination in your presentation. What is the, um, the latest there in terms of, will there be a more, uh, what is the latest with regards to strangles vaccination? Okay, um, better be, Careful talking about certain certain products. There, there, there is one that's available in in the UK and and Europe. Um, it, it's called a modified live vaccine that involves uh, injecting the upper lip, um, and it has its uses. And in fact, the company that produces it have been very responsible over the years in how they've promoted it, it, its use. There are a number of drawbacks with that approach, um, which I won't go into. And and what we've been looking for, and I'll I'll plug the animal health the Animal Health Trust here, and particularly Andrew Waller, working with a, a Swedish company, in order to produce um, hopefully a, 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 a safer vaccine in terms of adverse reactions, um, and one that we can more readily differentiate an infected animal from a vaccinated animal. And that's, uh, it's not a particularly new concept, but it's really important in terms of being able to handle um, outbreaks of disease where we may want to use uh, use vaccination if we can still use our diagnostic tests in order to help uh, in, in, in that control and a new, there is a new vaccine which hopefully will come out and be launched next year um, that's um, not based on a live uh, live bacteria uh, it's a series of proteins that have been put together and that stimulates the horse's immune response against against the organism uh, and the beauty of that is that it can be it's not going to trip the blood test 
looking at antibodies and it's not going to trip a test because it's not an organism it's not going to trip the um uh, the agent detection test you can't grow anything from it so that hopefully will be a game changer when it comes to using a vaccination whilst also looking to eradicate strangles from a population of animals thank you i mean tony obviously um strangles uh, is one of those uh, diseases that sort of sends a shiver down the spine of <laughs> everyone at world's Horse welfare and many of the other charities and um, so and and rich was absolutely right to sort of focus in on and the brilliant work the animal health trust has done in, in this area because did the blood test for strangles uh, and actually that isolation um of new arrivals it strangles is the disease that we we dread the most in many ways isn't it Yes, absolutely. And certainly we, we see hot spots in certain areas. And in the terms of the testing that we do, again, we risk assess the horses that are coming into our centres and take veterinary advice on what tests should be carried out when those horses come in. Brilliant. Um, so we are, it happens every time I look at the clock at the start of the question and answer session, I think, oh, well, we've got quite a long time to fill and we are rapidly joined to a close. But there's a great question here from a, a good friend of ours uh, on the other side of the water, Gail. Um, and uh, she, she's asked, and Richard, you mentioned African horse sickness, and obviously there's been a a case of African horse sickness out in Thailand uh, recently, uh, ongoing. She, and Gail's asked, are there any diseases of concern that may be on the horizon for equine infectious disease that we should be aware of? Um, yeah, African horse sickness you've, you've touched on there. Um, that's probably the, the number one. Um, in, in terms of the impact that it would have on the entire industry. We know from experience with blue tongue virus, which is a similar virus that affects livestock, that can spread it through midges um, over quite a large area quite quickly. So even if it appeared in mainland Europe, we would still be at risk of acquiring that. Um, we're aware of ongoing risks from diseases like equine infectious anemia, uh, a virus which is actually related to HIV, if you like, in, in humans, for which there's no vaccine, no cure, and in fact we are required to put animals down that are confirmed with that, that, that infection. Um, a bacterial disease called glanders, quite an ancient disease that we've managed to eradicate from many parts of the world, can look a bit like strangles, uh, is a disease that's reared its head uh, in Germany a number of years ago only affecting one horse thankfully but it, it's a reminder all the time that not all of these diseases have we managed to get rid of. Um, West Nile virus I, I've touched on we do have vaccines thankfully for that so that's something that you know we do have something in the toolbox that we can deal with that. Um, obviously you're always worried about new and emerging infections we've touched on flu um, flu the the one we really worry about is a new flu virus say coming from birds or pigs transferring into horses and then being able to transmit we won't have vaccines available to fight an infection like that and that would put us under a lot of pressure if that should happen and the flu virus that we're dealing with at the moment we're only aware of that since 1963 and in terms of a pathogen that's that's a very short period of time so there are a number of things that we are monitoring all of the time across the world because they're you know possibly only a plane ride away yeah richard thank you very much listen that's been a a, a really good session um it's we're coming up to the quarter past the hour so we need to to draw it to a close and tony um in uh, ha having heard what you've heard from richard and during the discussion what what are the key take-home messages for you well it's it's as i said during my presentation that every little helps i think that is the the absolute core thing here that it doesn't matter what type of yard you're on you can do something about biosecurity be aware of it take precautions when you need to and if something does go wrong make sure that you take appropriate action after that Absolutely, because it can go wrong for the best of, and it's not so. It's not failure if it goes wrong necessarily, but it can go wrong for the best people. So it's uh, it's it's a matter of just taking that quick action. Absolutely, Richard. Any take-home messages from you? Uh, 
Yeah, very much, uh, Giles, we've got what, what Tony said. Um, the, the mantra I have always had for the last 26 years, just to put it in context at the Animal Health Trust, is prevention is better than cure. Uh, it's usually cheaper in the long run uh, and hopefully more, more effective. So if people can really concentrate on that, think about the insurance policies of vaccination and quarantine um, and, you know, get to know your vet, use your vet, um, take their advice and uh, jump on things early. Richard, thank you. Um, listen, a, a big thank you to both Tony and to you, Richard, for, for, for joining us tonight. It's been, or, or today, it's been brilliant. And we've got covered so much ground in the last 75 minutes, and we could go on for certainly many more, but we'll need to draw it to a close. So thank you for joining us um, and presenting so eloquently. Thank you to everyone for really firing into questions. They're still coming in, and I'm very sorry uh, that we haven't been able to get to all of them. Um, but please do, uh, Tell your friends about the webinars we're running them every fortnight over over the summer and if you've got any ideas uh, of what we might want to cover uh, then please do send that through to education at worldhorsewelfare.org please do visit the world horse welfare uh, website there's plenty of information uh, around disease prevention that we've talked about this uh, today and also how to take your horse's temperature and pulse and respiration so please um, do look after yourself. Thank you very much for joining us and hopefully we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. In the meantime, take great care. Thank you very much. Thank you.